What's up, y'all? So I know I didn't announce this video, but I wanted to keep it as a little bit of a surprise. And I also wasn't sure if I could get it done this quickly, but I did. And here we are. My name is Stevie Matt, and today we'll be discussing season two of The Mandalorian. Welcome to It's Not That Deep. But before we even get started, I wanna make a very important disclaimer. I am not actually a really big fan of Star Wars. Oh, boo! I know, I know. Throw your tomatoes at me now. Boo! I know. I've watched all the movies except for Rise of Skywalker and Solo, including both the theatrical version and the remastered version of the original trilogy. I only really enjoyed Rogue One and The Last Jedi. Yes, I'm in that camp. I've seen none of the extended universe stuff and I retain very little of what I have seen. So even if I say I don't know something that was uh, explained in one of the movies that I said I did watch, just assume I don't remember it. <laughs> so if you are a super duper hardcore Star Wars fan looking for like a deep dive into how this show compares to the rest of the universe and how it fits within all the rest of the lore, I won't tell you to stop watching, but I'm sorry that's just not an analysis I'm able to offer you. All I have is the universe as constructed within the show itself. Okay, so I'm just going to say right off the bat that this season did not quite hit the same for me as season one did. I did a thread of my thoughts on Twitter um, on season one back when it first aired, and I can link that down below if you're interested in uh, reading through all that. But um, character is the reason why it didn't hit the same for me. Both seasons were very episodic, right, in that each episode sort of had its own self-contained story with bits of the main art creeping in until we start moving full speed ahead into the climax you know rather than each episode sort of just pushing us more directly towards our goal in a much more linear fashion and in season one that worked better for me because we didn't yet have a concrete goal we were just following mando along on his adventures learning who he was and that was the thing right we were learning who mando was so even when the mission was a whatever mission, we were still learning things about our main character, you know, his background, his values, stuff about the Mandalorian Creed and how seriously he takes it and, you know, all these things. So each episode really felt like something meaningful to me. And, you know, it culminates in finally seeing his face at the end, which was a moment that was built up beautifully throughout the whole season, and it just all really hit. But here, that structure no longer really works because we do have a concrete goal. Return Yodito to his own people. Yes, I know he has an official name now, and Grogu, I'm not gonna lie, is actually a really cute name, and I'm really happy they didn't try to make some corny play on Yoda and just gave him something wholly original. But he's been Yodito since season one, and that's just what he's gonna stay for me. I'm not a real Star Wars fan anyway, so I get to do what I want. <laughs> Any whomst. So we start off the season with that specific goal. And while we make baby steps towards it in each episode, it just moves a little too slowly for me for as few episodes as we have overall. You know, if, if this was back in the days of old network television shows where we had like 20 some episodes uh, to get through, then absolutely I'd say start off small little things and then slowly move your, you know, then slowly pick up speed later down the, lo the line cool but we don't we only got eight episodes here so let's get this show on the road we gotta keep moving <laughs> and then we're seeing mando's growth from season one you know he was really grumpy there and standoffish and sort of doing the whole lone ranger type deal and then here we're seeing him now he's a lot more cute with the kid it's awesome and he's a lot more open and warm with all the friends that he's developed since season one so we see that manifest in this season but it doesn't really go anywhere from there. That's just sort of where we get stuck. And you know, meeting Bo-Katan with the um, revelation that Mando might actually be from a fringe cult and not actually like what's mainstream Mandalorian culture, or at least that's how I interpreted what she said. If there's something there that would be known from the extended universe stuff, again, I have no idea. I just am going off of what has been explained in the show. But beyond that, we don't really get any further significant character development or world building. We're just, we have what we have. And so the show is very plot driven in that way. And then with the episodic structure dominating the first half of a very short season, we don't really even get that either. So it just felt like not a lot happened at all this season. So that was kind of disappointing. And the cinematography too. There were some great shots here and there, but I rarely had those wow moments that I had back in season one where it felt like every frame 
was a painting. It was gorgeous. But the exception of that is episode 5, chapter 13, The Jedi. Now, Moff Gideon revealed that he had the dark saber that was like the final shot in season one. But this is like, I think this is the first time that we see a lightsaber in action in this series. And appropriately, they play with lighting and fog the entire episode, keeping it all very dimly lit so that it keeps all your attention on those cool little light swords. This was easily the best episode visually. There were some very good choices made there. And even the fight choreo, which also was really underwhelming me this season, was a lot better in that episode. Ahsoka Tano is so badass, and it's really unfortunate that Rosario turned out to be ain't shit, because that did kind of spoil it for me. And if you don't know the story behind that, I'll encourage you to go look it up. I'm not going to get into it myself. Uh, that's not what this video is about. But the character was great, and I wouldn't be upset if they recast her with another black actress. Same for Cara Dune. I love the character, but Gina Carano's old Lucy Lawless looking ass could easily be replaced with another butch queen, and I wouldn't bat an eyelash. And that's just that on that. Thematically, the best episode is probably episode 7, chapter 15, The Believer. Uh, the conversation between Mayfield and that Imperial officer is one of the few times in this whole season that I feel like we get some real character work. You know, they take a drink with that officer, oh boy gets a little too shady and it goes the officer into saying some horrific shit, and we really see what an effect and how troubled Mayfield is about it all. So when he shoots that officer and starts that whole shootout escape, and you know, and then he blows up the Redonium, it's not just like flash, boom, pow. It's like this has some really deeper meaning. Yes, this was a direct hit to the Empire's return. This is going to be a snag in their operations or whatever. But it was also sort of personal payback for an Imperial officer's cruelty and malice, right? So it had some significant meaning. There were layers at work there. Fun fact, this episode was written and directed by Rick Famuyiwa, who, if you don't know who he is, you probably should, because he's great, clearly. The man knows what he's doing, and it showed in this episode. And then, of course, that finale, though. But first, another disclaimer. Now, I have no idea why you'd even be watching this video if you were trying to avoid spoilers, but I also haven't even said anything spoilery yet. That's about to change now, so if you are avoiding spoilers, this is where you should pause until you go get caught up. But be sure to come back once you're done. I miss you already. Bye. Okay, so... When Ahsoka said that there weren't many Jedi left, Luke was actually the first person that came to mind. What? Okay, I know I said I don't retain anything, but I do know Luke. What can I say? I mean, it's Last Jedi. It's right in the title, right? So anyway, he came to mind, and, but I'm like, nah, there's no way he's going to come back. They've retired the character. It's going to be some Jedi that I've never heard of who's going to drive the fans wild. Whatever. And then at that final moment, here come this Jedi being all cool, cutting through all them dark troopers with that little green lightsaber. And lo and behold, there he fucking is. Luke motherfucking Skywalker. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I feel like the reception to this surprise reveal will really depend on how invested in the story and all the lore that you are. I'm sure somebody's going to have reasons why it doesn't make any sense because of a timeline thing, chronology, continuity, something, that's that and the other. Again, that ain't my bag. <laughs> I don't really have strong feelings about it at all. And the CGI wasn't any worse than anything I've seen in a video game. You know, it looked a lot like if you ever, if you play Ghost of Tsushima, it looks very similar to that, just against the live action background. But whatever, I pushed through it, it was all right, whatever. I do feel like given how large the extended universe seems to be now, and that fan favorites like Ahsoka Tano and Boba Fett, who to my understanding, gained their popularity from that extended universe. Again, I could be wrong, but they were brought into the fold here. I'm not gonna lie, I was actually kind of disappointed it wasn't some Jedi that I had never heard about, and instead it was Luke the Skywalker. Like, I get it, you know, Boba is Boba, but this is Luke Skywalker. But I was like, oh, come on, let our space uncle rest already. <laughs> I know he tired. Actually, no, I think Mark Hamill loves doing this. He can't get enough. I don't know. Either way, I was just like, come on, the universe is so much bigger now. I don't know if we had to do this, but whatever. That's the Jedi who's going to train our young little Yodito, and it comes full circle because he trained under, you know, Big Yoda, little Big Yoda, whatever. All right, fine. It's not the most inspired choice, but here we are. And so Mondo taking off his helmet to say goodbye was pretty touching, and I did tear up just a little bit. 
But at this point, I, honestly, I just I was a little underwhelmed because I just ha I just wasn't that invested anymore. By this point, the choices that had led up to this moment just left me feeling a, a lot more detached than I would have wanted to be. It did not hit nearly as hard as season one getting me to weep over a damn droid. IG-11, Taika, you really ain't shit for that. You really, that shit hurt. <laughs> and that was my feeling overall about the whole season, you know, just underwhelmed. What I was most surprised by is that this ending suggested that we'll be seeing a lot less of Yodito in the next season, which I can't really see happening because this is a Disney property now on Disney Plus, and I just can't see them letting this gold mine of merchandise that is Baby Yoda get written off that easily, so we'll see. And we don't really get a concrete conclusion to the whole thing with Bo-Katan either. I guess we just assume that she died and Mondo is just the possessor of the Dark Saber now. I don't know if that means that the next season sees us exploring Mandalorian culture even more deeply, which I would really love. We got a lot of it in season one barely got anything in season two so i'd be down for that but it just the it spent a lot of energy rightfully so don't get me wrong but we spent a lot of energy in this finale saying goodbye to grogu our precious little small bean and it was really touching but it also felt like they just forgot to wrap up all their other narrative threads i'm not sure if the pandemic can be blamed for I don't know how empty this season felt or if maybe the surge in popularity of Baby Yoda, you know, made them adjust this season uh, to revolve around the little fella more than they originally intended or what. I guess I could look it up, but it really wouldn't matter because whatever went on behind the scenes, it doesn't change the fact that what we got on screen just felt undercooked to me. It sucks, but it is what it is. I did want to close this out with a few smaller things that I did enjoy. So I know the CGI on Luke's face is what the girls are going to be talking about for a while now. But for the majority of the season, they really rely on costuming and makeup for the non-human characters or, you know, animatronics uh, for Yodito. And it's all executed very well. I noticed in episode two with that frog-like woman that he was escorting to the other planet, um, you know, just so much emotion was communicated just through her body language. And so even before she figured out how to speak words to him, we got so much of how she felt and she was just so small like there was a scene where they're shooting her on the dock and everybody is just so much bigger than her and she looks so small and i just wanted to hug her and protect her and keep her safe and i was so worried about her until she reunited with her husband and even then i was like they better not but they didn't but that was done really well i really felt connected to her and i saw that with a lot of the non-humans just they did a really good job of well not humanizing because again they're not human but making the non-human characters still empathetic and easy to connect with through things like recognizable body language. And same for Pascal too, you know, we rarely see his face and yet he communicates so well. I've seen this in season one. He communicates body language so well through that armor so that it never feels like I'm not connected to him. I almost always know what he's thinking, what he's feeling like. In episode one, when Cobb Van takes off the helmet and he like, takes a step back you almost see him do like this so like even without seeing any change in facial expression he communicates his shock and disgust from him taking off his helmet through under that ar he communicates that so well under that armor that it just it hits very well uh Tamuera morrison was great as boba fett who is so badass in this show and ooh, he be driving the hell out that little ass weird little ship he got he whipped that hoe <laughs> Glad to see that they brought back Ming-Na Wen, this time as an ally, so I didn't have to root against her. That really hurt in season one. So I'm glad to see her back. She's always been great. She's been a favorite of mine since, I've loved her since Street Fighter, and she can fight too, so her action scenes are top tier. So I was happy to see her back. And Giancarlo Esposito. The scene where he was just taunting the hell out of Bo-Katan around that saber, I'm gonna be honest, I don't really trust that lady uh, that much anyway, so that whole thing was just delicious to me. He was digging in and she was getting pressed, ooh, and the whole time I'm like, I don't like neither one of y'all, so this is fun for me. <laughs> 
But yeah, he is just, he is so good. He is a God tier villain actor and he has such a blast doing it. And it's, I just, I love him so much. <laughs> and it's really just a great inherently diverse cast, you know, whether it's in the background or bit parts like that guy in the Jedi episode, the neighbor that ends up bringing everybody in or right there in the main roster, you're seeing black, Latina, Asian, Pacific Islander faces either behind costumes or bare face. We're all over the place. We're behind the camera too. You're seeing a lot of writing and directing credits pop up. We're just all over the place and that's how it should be. It's really that simple. It's easy. And that post credit sequence apparently confirmed that Boba is getting his own spinoff next year. So if Ming-Na returns with that one, that means that we're getting a Star Wars property led by a Maori man and a Chinese American woman. So like, even if I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan myself, it's like, ew. Love that. Love that for my friends who are. <laughs> and I might even tune in. So this season was a little disappointing, but clearly I'm still rooting for it. And here's hoping that they just bring it back to its former glory in season three. That's all I got for you today. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button. Feel free to leave a respectful comment. And I'm going to emphasize that here because I know fandoms can get quite volatile. <laughs> and while you're at it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you never miss another video. Be kind to yourselves and each other, and I'll see you in the next video.